If you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Romans. We'll get to that in just a second. In just a second, but Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to be starting out. Um, we've been going through a series. We started it last week on all in, and everything that we've sung today correlates with that being all in. Completely surrendered. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I want to give everything over to God. Well, why? I want to answer some questions of why and examine some people throughout Scripture that were all in. Characters that we can see that were all in. And last week we kind of touched on Abraham and Isaac. We we really spoke about Abraham and, and how Abraham was told by God, which this was, this was kind of strange to us. If you're, you know, if you're on the outside looking in, you're thinking, why on earth would God ask someone to sacrifice their son? <clears throat> well, God, the father, our heavenly father, willingly gave us his son for a sacrifice. And a lot of times God puts us through tests. Yes, God will test you. And we don't like those tests. But he wants to get us to a place where we examine ourselves, examine our relationship with him to see if we are truly all in for him. And we talked about it last week that Abraham and Isaac got to experience the God will provide himself a lamb moment. God has provided himself a lamb. God provides. In the midst of tests, in the midst of trials, in the midst of circumstances that we can't control and have no control over, God provides. And He's trustworthy. And He's worthy to be praised as we've done so this morning. But our key verse kind of for this series is in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I want to read that right now. It says, I I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We talked about it last week and we kind of broke this verse apart and I want to do that again each week in the beginning to get this to where it's, you know, I'm I'm thick skulled. You know, I'm hard headed. And sometimes it stinks, but I have to, I have to slip up and I fall and I have to come to the end of myself before I realize some things. And they have to be really drilled into my head. If you don't think that, you can ask my parents. They drilled a lot of things into my head over and over and over again in my growing up period in life. And, you know, I'm still learning those things, but I want to break this verse apart or these verses apart again and understand that Our purpose in life is to glorify God with our lives. How do I know that? Because the verses that we just read said that. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Part of worship is glorifying and honoring God. And our bodies are to be a living sacrifice. And we talked about it last week and I touched on it last week. That a living sacrifice is not like a dead sacrifice. It's not like something that you go up and you sacrifice one time and it's all over with, said and done. But this is something that is continual. It's a living sacrifice. It's me getting up every day of my life even when I don't feel like it. And sacrificing all that I am and all that I have over to God, a living sacrifice, which is my spiritual worship to God. That's 
this is the very least thing that I can do for Him. Like, this is minimal. So, our purpose in life is to glorify God with our lives. And that takes a sacrifice. Our bodies, a living sacrifice. So, gaining that and and gathering all that information from these two verses of Scripture, we can see that our lives are to be lives that are all in for God. We should be all in. No matter what. So, we talked about Abraham and Isaac and what God did in that in that particular time, in that particular instance in their life. And I was thinking about it, and as I was praying, and it being Mother's Day, you know, I wanted to bring out, you know, sometimes preachers can, can skip over women really easy. I mean, because there's a lot of, there's not a manly, bold characters in the Bible, you know. But then there's also a lot of women that were bold, that did a lot of things a lot of good things and glorified God in their lives and it being Mother's Day, we wanna we wanna bring out the ladies today. So you can turn over to Esther. Esther chapter four is where we're gonna talk. And before we get into the scripture, I'll kind of give you a background of what's going on here. For some of you that may not know. Um Basically what happens here is there's, there's, there's pretty much three, well, four counting the king. But there's basically three main characters. Four if you count the king. There's Esther, who is the queen, who, is, who, who has just become queen. And then there's Mordecai, who is her uncle, Esther's uncle. And then there's Haman. And Haman was kind of the king's right-hand man. And so that's kind of the characters that's, that's, that's found in Esther. I mean, there's a few more that, that you'll see throughout that, uh, through, throughout this book, but those are kind of the main characters. What's happening here is Esther gets selected to be queen. She comes before the king and he selects her to be his queen. She's, she's now taken in. She's, you know, She's living in the palace now. Mordecai, who, and, and here's the thing. They're living in a foreign country. They're, they're in a foreign place. And here's, here's Mordecai and Esther who are Jews. And there's a lot of Jews that are living in this place. Under this rule, basically. And Haman is this guy. He's the king's right hand man. He hates Jews. Sounds like someone from not too long ago, a few years ago, Hitler, hated the Jews, wanted to annihilate them. And that's basically what Haman sought out to do. He basically weaseled his way into the king and had him sign, or was getting him to sign a decree to basically annihilate all the Jews. And so that's kind of where the story is, is... You know, the king, one, one of the things, too, that you, I mean, there's so much that I can't really, you know, give you everything and pack it all into a, a simple sermon and, and just kind of a, a reflection time and give you the gist of what this is all about. And Esther, you really, you really should go back home and read the whole book because it's packed slap full of good, awesome stuff. But, you know, Esther was very beautiful. I mean, she was... She was a knockout, and the king recognized her, and he he sought you know she 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 found favor in the eyes of the king, and so that's kind of where we're at. Esther chapter four, we're going to start in verses ten and read read down through sixteen, and this will kind of give us the the storyline here. So Haman has you know gotten the king to get to this place where he's going to annihilate all the Jews. And so Esther and, and Mordecai find out. Mordecai was a very godly man. And, and so here we're going to find a conversation between Esther and Mordecai here. Uh, verse 10, it says, Then Esther spoke to uh, Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know 
that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death. Except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But if but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susha, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king... Though it is not, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. <clears throat> wow. That's a crazy story. So, Haman hated the Jews so bad that Mordecai just basically, when he found out that Esther had not been called to come before the king, and basically Mordecai is working in the background saying, Esther, listen, God's put you in this place. <laughs> God's put you here. So that you can try your best to defend and change what's fixing to happen to these Jewish people. God's placed you. Do you not see the gift that has been given to you in your life and the sphere of influence that God has presented to you so that you can reach this king and hopefully he will grant you favor and grant us favor and not annihilate the Jews. But understand this, God's placed you here. But don't think that just because you live in the palace, that you're going to escape the wrath because Haman hates us. And just because you live in the palace, because you are a Jew, you will die. You're going to die. You're on the chopping block just like the rest of us. Because you're a Jew and Haman hates us. And the king cannot go back, basically, on what he said. And the order that he's put out. So don't think you're going to be saved. And I love that part that Mordecai says and replies back to Esther. And and I'm sure, you know, our Bible puts it in this way. But I'm sure Mordecai was not thinking, well, who knows? No, I think Mordecai knew. But it's put in our Bible and, and, and it's put in a way... And he replies back, Esther, who knows? Just maybe. You were placed in this position. You were placed here. God has you here for such a time as this. So that's the all-in moment that I want to talk about today. Is there comes a point in our life, there comes a, a time in our life where we need to experience the for such a time as this. I'm all in. I'm all in. And understand that God has us here for a such a time as this moment. You're not here by accident. I don't understand how we can... We can think with our minds and try to rationalize things and think that, oh, it's just chance that I show up to church today. No, God has you here for a purpose and a reason so that you get it into your mind and into your heart and you grab a hold of what God's wanting to say to you today that for such a time as this, you have been placed here ordained by God at this moment so that your life may be changed to glorify and honor Him. The sphere of influence that you are a part of, the people that God has around you for such a time as this, He has you there to reach out to their lives and show them the love of Jesus Christ. And you don't know, you have no clue and no idea 
who you can reach and what kind of impact that you can make on the hearts and lives of other people. Esther wasn't, you know, Esther wasn't really realizing the place and the status that she had. And Mordecai's like, listen up. I understand that you might die if you do this. And, and I mean, Esther's even pleading her case back to Mordecai and saying, listen, he has not, the king's not called on me for 30 days. And you know just as good as I do, Mordecai, that the law is, if I go to him without being called, that I'll be put to death unless he raises his scepter. Mordecai says, listen, in a few days, that's not all going to matter, really, because we're all going to die. One way or another, you're going to die. So will you be all in? Will you use the sphere of influence? Will you you appreciate what it is, the position that God has placed you in to reach people for Him? To change the outcome of their lives? Have a part to play in the outcome of their lives to glorify God? See, there comes a point where we must want... To glorify God no matter what. I mean, we kind of saw that a little bit last week when we looked at the life of Abraham. And when God asked him to sacrifice his son. you got to be willing. And what happened? You know, Abraham did not have to actually sacrifice Isaac. I mean, he, he was willing. He had the knife drawn. But God spoke and said, Abraham, Abraham, now I know that you fear me. Now I know. And God wants to push us. God wants to to work in our lives, in the tests of our lives, to push us to a place where, one, we understand where we stand with God. And two, to prove to Him, now I know. Now I know, Christy, that you fear me. Now I know, David, that you fear me. That you're willing to go anywhere for me. To do anything. I know now that I can ask you to do anything. And you'll trust me. And you'll believe me. And you'll do it no matter what the outcome, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what it is that you face. You fear me. You love me. You believe in me. You trust me. You know that I'm a God that provides. You know that I have you in this place, in this time, for such a time as this. And I want you to experience that in your lives. So will you do that? Will you be all in for God? Will you be all in for me? Mordecai replies to him, and I'm going to read this again. And and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows? Maybe you came to this church today for such a time as this. Because you need to know Jesus and the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed for you and the sacrifice that He gave for you so that you may know life and peace, everlasting life and peace in your heart. For such a time as this, maybe you're here and you're a believer in Christ and you just happen to show up on Mother's Day. You're here for the first time or maybe you're a regular attender. God has you here for such a time as this to hear this so that you can realize that I'm not here by accident. God has a purpose and a plan for my life and it is to get out of my comfort zone, out of the four walls of the safety of this building, out of the four walls of my safety of my home, To reach the people that God puts me in contact with and touch with every day of my life. That I might be a testimony and a witness to them to glorify God's name. So Esther replies back and he says, listen, she says, listen, I'm going to, you tell the Jews to fast. That says a lot right there. Because there's, there's, there's two things we can take away from, from what Esther did and how she replied to this moment. Number one, she knew she had to pray. She knew she had to prepare for what it was God was calling her to do. 
So she was ready to pray. And she said, not only do I need to pray, but listen, Mordecai, you get the Jews to fast and pray for three days, day and night. Me and my young women, which was basically her handmaids, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to fast and we're going to pray. When you're in the pit, when you're in the midst of circumstances that you can't explain, when you feel like God is closing in on you and testing you and saying, I'm pushing you to understand and know that I've got something better for you. Now I'm needing to know, do you fear me? Are you willing to go all in for me? Sometimes we need to just take a step back, get on our knees before God and pray and fast and seek God's face and say, Lord, whatever it is that you want me to do, God, I'm willing. And that's kind of what we see here. Esther's reply said, then after I've done this, after we fasted and prayed, then I will go to the king. Though it is against the law. Though it doesn't make sense. See, that's the thing. Though it does not make sense. Though it pushes me way, way outside my comfort zone. Though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to do what it is that God wants me to do. So there has to come a point where we want to glorify God no matter the outcome. And that's tough. That's, that's big. That's big faith. To be willing to do whatever no matter what the outcome may be. Like Getting to a place in our lives and saying, God, I know that you're going to provide for my needs. So, Lord, I'm going to trust you. And if on the outside looking in, everybody thinks that I live in poverty, I'm going to trust you. Because you're going to provide for my needs. You said, God, your word said, you'd provide for my needs. And so the world may look on the inside and say, man, they're worthless. But God, you've put me in a sphere of influence of people. And God, if it's to live among the people that are impoverished, to reach them for the glory of Christ, then so be it. God, if you grant me riches to reach the rich, then so be it. God, if you call me to another country, a faraway place that I'm not comfortable with at all, no matter the outcome, I may go just like Jim Elliott to a place that as soon as I get there, I get a spear pierced right through me and die. But you've called me to do that, God. And no matter the outcome, I'm okay with it. Because I want to bring glory to your name. Not to myself. Not so that I can have status. Not so that I can have some kind of ego boost for myself. So that I can glorify and honor you with my life. So whatever that looks like, God, I'm okay with it. Now here's the bold question. Are you all in? Do you have that kind of all in about you? Because that's what God's calling us to do. That your life be a living Sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our worship. I want to read two different versions of this next verse. First Timothy chapter six, if you want to be turning there. 
First Timothy chapter six, and we'll start in verses uh, five through eight. I'm going to read it through. I'm going to read it in the ESV version, and then I'm going to read it in the NLT version, just because the NLT almost kind of slaps you upside the face. And, and I like that sometimes. I, I like for God's Word to be bold and, and, you know, sometimes we need to get knocked upside the head to get it through. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, it says this, And constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Alright? Now listen to the NLT. These people always cause trouble. (laughs) Their minds are corrupt, and they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Now what does that got to do with what you just said about Esther? She was content. Where she was, in the place that she was, and she got rich, she got outside of her comfort zone, outside of the box of the status that she had. I'm queen. I'm safe. Sorry, Mordecai, you and the Jews are on your own. Mordecai says, listen, do you not understand that Haman hates Jews so much that this is not going to save you? You're going to be caught right in the thick of this, just like the rest of us. So she was not, she did not take her status and think of it too highly that she was not willing to do what God had called her to do. But she was willing to go and said, if I perish, I perish. But sometimes we get it in our mind and we get it in our head that godliness is great gain. You know, that that there's, you know... That there's wealth. We're, we're all about riches. We're all about the things that we can gain. You know, what's best for me? I'm looking out for number one. And I'm not saying that you don't take care of yourself. And I'm not, take, I'm not saying that you don't take care of your family. But when those things and those priorities come before God, then we have a problem. We have an issue. And there's sin in our life. And here's the, here's the deal. Because we live in America and we've got it so stinking good, we are constantly putting things and worth and wealth in front of God and the things that He desires for us to do. And my heart's cry and my heart's prayer is that God, You get us to a place where we're content. That as long as we have food and as long as we have clothes, God, we're content. You've taken care of us. Your promise has been fulfilled that you have provided for all of our needs. God, I don't need, I have no need to be wealthy. All that does is just boost me up and get people to look at me. And God, I don't want people to look at me. I want people to be directed and look at Christ when they see me. They see Christ in me, working in and through my life. And so God, no matter what that looks like, if it is to be wealthy, if it's to be poor, if it's to go to a foreign country, whatever it is, and that's the deal, folks. What God's called you to do in your life is going to look different than what God's called me to do in my life. Your all-in for God is going to look different than my all-in for God. But it's going to be recognizable. People are going to know. People are going to see. Man, that person is on fire for God. 
And that's my heart's cry and my heart's prayer for this nation. Because of the place that we're in and how good we have it. I mean, it's ridiculous. We think we have it so bad. Go on the internet and look at some of these places. Look at World Vision. Look at some of these ones, these orphanages, some of these villages that they're just trying to get clean water to. They live in huts made of grass with dirt floors. Their skin and bone. Okay, this is Mother's Day. Mom, how would it make you feel if you knew you could not provide for your kids? Does that not break your heart? Can you imagine being a mother or a father? And some of you have kids. Some of you have really young kids. Can you imagine being in the place, in the spot that those moms and dads are in that they can't provide food and all they have to do is just, all they can do is listen to their kids scream and cry because their belly is so hungry or they're so thirsty. Put your kid in that place. Man, we would jump. We we would do anything. We would sacrifice everything. To give our kids food and water and clothes. But are we willing to sacrifice to gain wealth and to gain rapport and to gain riches? Are we willing to really sacrifice everything that we completely miss God? Because that's where we are as a nation. We don't know how good we have it. I mean, you may be here and living paycheck to paycheck. Guess what? You got it better than the majority of the world. You are in the minority. If you went to one of these countries, they would say, you are rich. You're blessed. Most of us are going to leave this place and go have lunch somewhere with our mom. Or our wife. We're blessed. We may go home and eat. We may have a roast cooking in the crock pot. We're blessed. I'm making y'all hungry, ain't I? We are blessed. I want to be all in for God. When the world looks at me, what do they see? Do they see Jesus? Do they see someone who's willing to sacrifice everything for the glory of God? Or do they look at someone that, you know, yeah, he preaches on Sundays, but nobody really knows how he lives the rest of the week. Yeah, we come and listen to a good sermon, feel good sermon, we get a pat on the back, we get encouraged, then we go home and we live the same way we've always lived. No dedication, no surrender. But all in is a sacrifice. All in is a sacrifice. And I want to be a sacrifice. No, I'm not looking to be someone who's martyred. No, I'm not actually looking to just be poor. But I am willing to say, God, whatever it looks like, whatever brings you glory, that's what I want to be. See, I want to give you just a personal testimony time about that God is taking you to a place of full surrender. I was 13 years old when I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart to save me. And I can promise you right now, I did not live like a Christian from there on. I've had my ups and I've had my downs. I've had my failures. But at 13, I remember asking Jesus to come into my heart and save me. 
And I can remember God at work in my life and, and what Dan shared with us last month on discipleship and disciple making and the importance of that. I can attest to that. Because a lot of the reason, and I'm not blaming people for this, but a lot of the reason that I fell off the map is because there was no discipleship in my life. No one came along and took me under their wing and showed me what it was to be a Christian. How to study my Bible. How to pray. <laughs> all these questions, all these things that had happened to me, given me answers through Scripture of, man, you know, hey, yeah, you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and save you. Now let me explain to you through Scripture what just happened to you. All you know is, hey, man, I got peace. <laughs> God saved me. But now I want to explain. You know, what is it that just took place in my life? That's discipleship. And there's importance in that. And we need to put an incentive on that. And I appreciate Dan and his, his ability to do that and his heart and desire to do that for us. But it was at the age of 17. 17. You know, several years later, and I had gone through some stupid stuff. I had done some really retarded things in my life as a kid. Rebellious. My kid, my parents can t attest to that. You know, re rebellion. You know, not living for God. Falling off the map. Just being, you know, just being stupid punk, basically. And I can remember at 17 when Jesus spoke into my heart. And I had been running for a month. And I, I was starting to get closer to God and, and feeling God drawing me to a place of surrender. Like, that's the thing. I remember experiencing Jesus Christ's salvation in my life. And then I can remember when I made Him Lord. When I surrendered everything over to Him. And that was at 17. And I can remember being at that place and God said, I'm calling you to preach. And for a month, I ran from God. I tried to run from that thing. I said, God, you have got the wrong person. There is no way I am preaching. No chance. My, I grew up a preacher's kid. My dad was a pastor all my life. I was like, there is no stinking way you're getting me up there. No way. And God kept hounding me and hounding me and drawing me and drawing me and basically testing me. Testing me. Pushing me. And you know what's been beautiful and awesome? Is I've been able to experience, just like Abraham, the God will provide moments. When I surrendered and gave it all up to Him, I experienced His provision for my life. And then we have said as a staff here at Rock Solid Church that we feel like our lives have been led and all the testing and all the circumstances and all the hell that we've been through on earth, seemingly. That God has done this in preparation for such a time as this. So we're experiencing the for such a time as this moment. And God has that for your life. And He's calling you and He's testing you and He's pushing you and saying, will you be all in for me? Will you surrender it all to bring glory to my name? So that my name be lifted high. And that's the thing. Honest to God, what I believe God is getting ready to do in this church and through the life of this church is not something that any one person can take credit for. And I am looking forward to that because here's the deal. I don't want credit for it because if I get credit for it, it's all vain and it's selfishness. And my righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. And I want to bring glory to His name. And there will be no one that can take credit for it. But it will bring glory to God. No one, just like the song that we sang, no one can steal His 
glory. And that's the deal. I don't want to steal it. I don't want to rob God of His glory. I want to bring Him glory with my life and everything that's in me to praise His holy name and to glorify Him because He has been so good to me and done so much for me. People from the outside are going to look in and say, and no one, no particular one, they're not going to say, oh, Jason's this, you know, crazy, you know, extravagant or whatever you want to call it, put whatever kind of adjective or verb or whatever you want to talk about in there to talk about what kind of preacher I am. I am nothing. Just like we read when we started the service out. My life is a mist. I am but dust. I am nothing without God. And so, God, will will you join with me? Church, will you join with me in full surrender to God and be all in for the glory of God and remove yourself from the equation and just say, God, whatever it looks like, whatever it is, I want to bring glory to your name. I want to surrender it all to you because I don't want to be able to take credit for it, God. I want people to see you. And see a power. And to see a movement of God that we have never experienced before on the face of this planet. So that no man can steal His glory. But all glory and praise be to God. Will you join with me? Will you be in full surrender? Will you be all in? All in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. God, I thank You for this day. I thank You for Your love and Your mercy to us, God. I thank You. Lord, I pray that in some way, somehow, that You have achieved in this time. Lord, You said, and I'm going to just stand on Your promise. You said that Your Word would not return void. So God, I'm standing on that promise. And Lord, I have preached Your Word with all my heart. And God, I cannot change these people. Lord, it must be the Spirit drawing them. And it must be You that does the change and the work in their heart. But God, I pray that we get to a place of full surrender and Lord, full Lordship of our lives. Lord, that we make You Lord of all. And no matter what it is, Lord, that You choose to do with us in our lives, God, that we surrender everything that we are to You. That we become all in. Lord, those that are here that don't know You as Lord and Savior of their heart and life, God, I pray that they realize and that they have heard that the sacrifice that has been given through Jesus Christ, Your only Son, so that they might know what salvation is, that they know they are a sinner destined for an eternity in hell. And without You, God, we are hopeless But Your Son, Jesus Christ, came to seek and to save those who were lost and hopeless. So God, here we are. Lord, we are just in need of You. And Lord, we stand in Your presence now. Lord, in full surrender to You, God, do Your work in people's hearts and lives today. Draw them in this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand as they sing and play. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm begging you to come. I'm going to ask if we just bow our heads and close our eyes because I don't want there to be any kind of distractions. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's critical. That's key. Today, today get that right. If the Spirit is drawing you, you make the first step to this altar. There's others that will come up. I'll be up here. We want to share Jesus with you. If you're here and you want to proclaim in your life today, you want to draw a line in the sand and say, today, I surrender all. God, I want to be all in for you no matter what it looks like. You be obedient to what God wants you to do. Amen.